Well, hello. Thank you for joining me. This is a sermon on John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. It is the appointed lectionary text for Reformation Day 2021. As is our custom, we will begin with reading the lesson. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. So, people of God, grace to you and peace from God our Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, in his one precious Holy Spirit. Amen. In our lesson today, Jesus speaks to people like us, people who believe in him. He speaks to them with clarity and directness and gentleness. May God give us the grace to both hear and heed him. Our setting is Jerusalem. Jesus has come to Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of the booths. This is one of the three great festivals of the Jewish calendar. Each year, any and all Jews who are able were to assemble in or near Jerusalem to participate in temple activities and to live in little huts either outside of town or, if they ordinarily lived in Jerusalem, on the roofs of their houses. The annual festival commemorated the 40 years that Israel spent wandering in the wilderness after they escaped their slavery in Egypt, the 40 years before they were allowed to enter the Promised Land. In this way, Israel was perpetually reminded and could never forget how God had rescued and kept them, how God had defended and fed them, how God had led them and loved them. So during the days of this festival, Jesus taught in the temple, earning the wrath of the professionally religious and earning the love and the favor of many common people. At one point, the temple police were dispatched to arrest him, but instead they fell under his sway and they allowed him to continue teaching. He said that anyone who was thirsty could come to him. He said that he was the light of the world. He claimed that everything he said and everything he did was in perfect conformity with the Father's will and that he did and said those things as the Father had instructed him. And many people believed in him. And it's to those believing people that Jesus speaks in our lesson today. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And they were deeply offended. Now, to be fair, we can understand the offense without a lot of effort. First, Jesus says, I'll know which one of you are true by watching which of you continue to follow me. I'm not interested in short-term affiliations. I want people who continue to follow. And as you follow, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free, which more than implies that they don't yet know the truth and they are not currently free. That's a lot for anyone to swallow. And we can also understand, having been thus offended, that their answer might lack a certain grace. None of us are at our most articulate best when we're offended. However, it's very difficult to excuse the monstrous idiocy, idiocy of their response. We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Remember, these are people who right now, currently, are living in huts to remember how their ancestors lived when God rescued them from 490 years of slavery in Egypt. These are the people whose ancestors were conquered by the Assyrians, the Midianites, the Moabites, the Philistines, the Persians, the Babylonians, and several other empires. 
These are people who are currently occupied and serving Rome. Most of us would have laughed out loud hearing this claim that Israel had never been enslaved by anyone. Israel spent more time enslaved than they did free. It happened over and over and over and over. It was the greater part of their national life. Jesus is, of course, as always, better than any of us. Whether he let there be a pause for people to recognize their monumental dumbness is not recorded, but Jesus doesn't respond directly to their faulty grasp of their own history. Instead, he recasts the conversation in a way that will not trigger national pride. Listen, he says, very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Jesus says to them and to us, you are slaves. You are underestimating how completely sin disfigures you, how completely it binds you. Almost certainly these followers of Jesus thought about sin the same way that most of us do. Sin are mistakes that we sometimes make, naughty things that we sometimes do, little aberrations in otherwise good and decent lives. They're the exception, certainly not the rule. Of course, the naughty things are the most obvious sins, but they are by no means our only sin. To sin means to miss the mark, to do anything different than what God would have us do in a particular situation. So of course we sin when we do the naughty things, but we also sin when we don't do all the good that we could. We sin when we don't discipline our bodies and our minds. We sin when we allow our character to remain undeveloped. We sin when we're ungrateful and when we're unaware. We sin when we don't notice and cultivate beauty. We sin when we disregard justice, when we fail to live in peace, when we fail to remember that we are brothers and sisters of every other person. We sin in both pride and in despair. We sin when we forget that we're the stewards of all of God's gifts, of everything we think we own, of the whole creation. Here's the truth. We're lazy. We're self-absorbed. We neglect our studies. We're quick to forgive ourselves and quick to judge others. We're often rude. We're often thoughtless. We don't acknowledge the needs of the poor and we receive God's grace as if it were an entitlement. We miss the mark way more than we hit it, and none of us can go a single hour in perfect harmony with God's ways, God's priorities, and God's will. In short, we are bound by sin. We can't put it down. We can't let it go. We can't get away from it. We are helpless in its grasp. It owns us utterly. It rules us as certainly as any slave has ever been ruled by a taskmaster with a whip. We all know this. We mumble and we pretend, we dissemble and we lie, but we know it deep in our bones. And Jesus says to anyone who would hear, then or now, you are enslaved. And slaves are not a permanent part of the household. Slave can always be sold away. The slave is a thing and not a person. The slave has no enduring standing, no claim, no hope. I, however, says Jesus, am not a slave. I am the father's son. I have a permanent place in the household. I have a place there forever, and if I make you free, you are free indeed. To which we must say, Amen, come Lord Jesus, set us free. Which leads us right back into the start of this conversation, right back into the lesson, which we can now hear with relief and not with offense. If we would be free, we will continue in his word and we will practice living in truth. We will not pretend that we have arrived. We will not forget our need. We certainly will not claim that our heritage or our ancestors guarantee us a place in the kingdom. We will never imagine that simple church membership, 
or nominal affiliation is the extent of what Christ intends or of what he calls us to do. Today is Reformation Sunday. On this very day, 504 years ago, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of All Saints Church in Wittenberg, Germany. These were 95 sentences that he was prepared to debate and to defend, and for us, they, began, they mark the beginning of our Protestant Christian faith. It's no coincidence, of course, that the lectionary text chosen for today is reflected in Luther's theses. Let's just look at the first three. Let's remember the first three together again. The first is, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he willed the entire life of the believers to be one of repentance. Second, this word cannot be understood as referring to the sacrament of penance, that is, confession and satisfaction as administered by the clergy. Third, yet it does not mean solely inter inner repentance. Such inner repentance is worthless unless it produces various outward mortification of the flesh. Now the language is old, but I trust you understand. Our tradition calls us to heed Jesus and to live lives of true repentance. We're called to remember that true repentance is not just feeling sad that we messed up. Rather, true repentance will show in our lives and in our character. And that when Jesus says, follow me, he intends that our lives would be marked by his commands, his priorities, his sensibilities. May the Holy Spirit, which you have received in your baptism, shape your hearts and your minds that you might be true disciples, that you might walk in the ways of Jesus, and that you might glorify our Father who is in heaven. Jesus says to those who believe in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen.